Hello all YouTubers, I am the Brother Dude. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thank you all for tuning back into this 19th Hurricane Season discussion for August 13th, 2020. Before I get on with today's video, however, it would be really awesome if you guys did hit that subscribe button. Thank you guys so much, by the way, for 900 subscribers. We are almost there. We're less than 100 away from the big ultimate goal of 1,000 subscribers. So please don't forget to hit that subscribe button, as well as ring the bell notification so you don't miss my next upload. Also, watching the whole video because getting to the goal of 1,000 subscribers in monetization, we're getting very close. And you guys watching the whole video will help the weather dude channel out a lot so please consider watching the whole video as well please do and also like and share this video with your friends thank you now let's go on with today's video so this is our 19th hurricane season discussion signs of a hyperactive 2020 land hurricane season uh, we'll be talking about the tropics again today I'm doing this 19, another hurricane discussion, our 19th one, coming up on our 20th, because, um, well, A, there's a lot to talk about in the tropics. I mean, well, the fact that this hurricane season could potentially be very active, which is why I always want to keep you guys informed and keep you updated on this. But also, you guys have been giving these hurricane season videos such support. The last one, several, several hundreds of views, and I'm very proud. So thank you guys. Hopefully, we can try and get this one to 1,000 views. So hopefully, that'd be, that'd be really great if you guys could do that. Um, but... Our 19th target season discussion, I've appreciated all the support of my channel, but especially from these videos, these have really um, got a lot of support. So thank you guys for that. And so let's get started on our 19th target season discussion here. I can't believe I'm doing this many, but here I am. All right. So it's always good to talk about the tropics, right? Because that's the best thing to talk about, especially during the mid to late summer and fall. So looking at our little line in your watch, again, to those of you that don't know, because I'm sure there's some of you watching that may not know, um, because I know some of you watching these are sadly not subscribed to the weather dude, so you may not know this but a landing to watch has been activated here um and what's it what does this mean well this pretty much doubles the normal likelihood that we usually see for a la nina to occur to around 50 percent and seeing the chances of a la nina during the southern hemisphere spring aka northern hemisphere fall have increased to 50 percent so there is a increased probability you can say for landing to watch does this guarantee a la nina no if we were getting down towards the actual la nina category through la nina alert that would really increase our chance for La Nina, and that would pretty much make it likely, not guaranteed, but likely. But we are not like a possibility of a La Nina, this doesn't guarantee it, but it does, does indicate that some factors are definitely starting to line up that we could see La Nina. One of those factors being the Nino 3-4 sea surface temperature anomalies. The region in the um, eastern and central Pacific here, right along the equator pretty much, uh, it's kind of like your Nino 3-4 right in the middle there, uh, pretty much going due south of Hawaii. It's kind of like New South of Hawaii on an Inyo 3-4 or on the equator line. Okay, that's kind of like where you find your uh, Inyo 3-4 region. And looking at the sea surface temperature anomalies for August, as you can see from the latest borough meteorology maps here, we're in a negative neutral. We're very close to a line Inyo here, um, and this is definitely a sign of what is to come. You can see September, we're getting pretty close, pretty darn close to a line Inyo here. Some of the models actually have us in a line Inyo by September. I think our best chance will be September through November during our fall time, or during our fall period, to see... Uh, a La Nina develop at some point in time. How long is it going to last? We don't quite know. But October, all right, the La Nina, but from my perspective, uh, if the La Nina does come, it'll last for about one to three months. I'd say one or two months, could be three at best, but we could see a re-spike re back to neutral conditions um, pretty soon after the La Nina starts taking place. Um, if a La Nina does take place, if not, like I said, even in a neutral pattern, 2005, I keep saying this, 2005, all right, was our record-breaking hurricane season in terms of, you know, named storms and everything, and that wasn't a La Nina year. That was actually, matter of fact, a neutral year, not El Nino, but it, but it was a neutral year. So a neutral year can result in a lot of hurricanes as well, but a La Nina can as well. All right, so so both, so basically, you're almost, I'm almost kind of saying that a 66% chance of an active hurricane season, because if a neutral, there's three possible things it could be, El Nino, neutral, or La Nina. So if neutral and La Nina both res typically result in active hurricane seasons and El Nino doesn't, we basically have a 33% chance of seeing a less, a less active hurricane season. Think about it. 2020 forecast, forecast be very active. 2019, 18, 17 were all very active seasons. Okay, all right. 2016, I remember being quite so active, but 17, 18, and 19, all right, we're all we're three very active seasons here, and 20 could be the fourth one, all right? So... 
2016, I remember being very active, but I mean, it all depends where you live, right? Florida had Hurricane Matthew, so, and so did the Carolinas, all right? So, I mean, it depends which person from which state you ask. All right, but then I also have to remember 2000, so 13 through 15, maybe not so 16, but 13 through 15, I remember were pretty quiet uh, for the most part. And 2012 was very active, primarily due to Hurricane Sandy. We had a lot of name storms that year as well. 11, we had Irene, um, some couple particular storms that actually hit the weather dudes region. But again, heading through November, I think maybe according to the models, at least, our best chance of seeing a La Nina here and then respiking by December. But I do not have a December map because it that does not involve hurricane season because no, hurricane season for the Atlantic ends November 30th. And the mean of all the models is down to about one degree, a sum up of all eight of these models here, summing up to about a degree or so below average. All right. So looking at the graph here, as you can see, um, like I said, October, maybe according to the Burr Meteorology, then November, maybe even December. So like I said, one to three months, one or two months or so, and then by January, we could be back into neutral. But like I said, it's not like as soon as it touches La Nina, we could classify as La Nina. It has to stay there for a certain period of time because otherwise it would just be coincidental. Like during May, we dropped to 0.6 degrees below average in the Nino 34 region. Now by American standards, 0.5 is considered La Nina. So we'd be thinking, oh, we had a La Nina. Like I said, it only lasted maybe a couple days, not even. And it went right back up in the neutral. Then it went, so basically it went from here, it went from here all the way down about 0.6 during the month of May. I mean, I'm just drawing the line somewhere. Then I went back up to point two, and then that, that's how it went during May into uh, June. So that's just a little perspective here that sometimes we can have some ups and downs. Don't pay attention to every single, you know, raise and drop. Focus on the overall trend here is what we're going to be focusing on. So looking at the lining your probabilities, going up to around 50%, 44% through October, November. October, according to this, seems to be our best chance, where our chance for La Nina is actually greater than our chance for neutral. But notice this, no El Nino. All right, that's going to be key for our hurricane season here. So looking at our Nino 3-4 SST anomalies, um, definitely around 0.6 around August, I think it's pretty agreeable. Maybe dropping as low as a degree by October and December, a degree below average. Like I said, the only reason I put December here is because I always put three of these graphs on here and it skips every two months, so I couldn't find November. But there you go. So our latest, I mean latest, sea surface temperature anomalies, as you can see, you cannot find one single spot in the Atlantic Basin that has below average waters. All right? Now, oh, yes, the Jersey Shore, and yes, there's a little spot out here, but really, 99.5% of the map is covered in either orange and red, and maybe a little bit of white, too. I'd say white covers about a couple percent. All right, but majority, by far, is all orange and red here, and this signifies above average sea surface temperatures that's starting to take place here, which is bad news, especially since... August is the, well, especially September. August and September is when we have the warmest sea surface temperatures of the year. So if it's warmer than average than that, then we got problems. The, I'm talking about the Caribbean. I'm talking about the Gulf of Mexico. I'm talking about the West Tropical Atlantic, especially surrounding Bermuda. All right, we're going to get to the Tropical Atlantic as well. Don't think I forgot about you guys. Looking at the actual ocean temperatures, we're getting to around 31 degrees Celsius, which is well into the upper 80s, clo closing in on 90, being pretty close. Uh, surrounding Bermuda, we got upper 80s in terms of our ocean water temperatures widespread throughout the Caribbean, 80s, well in the upper 80s maybe as well. Um, now let's take a look at the East Shock Atlantic because I did not forget about you. Now the MDR region as a whole is still actually looking at some above average waters, but the African coast, due to all the convection we've been seeing, um, sometimes, I mean obviously more convection, more hurricane development, which I will be showing you in a bit, um, which is uh, actually a map I've been starting to use more lately. When tropical systems move through, we get a little cooler air behind them. So briefly, you're going to be seeing some below average waters, but it's only for the African coast. Much of the MDR, the main development region, where hurricanes usually develop this time of year, still above average waters, and that's key for this hurricane season. As well as the subtropics. We've seen stuff develop in the subtropics, especially later in the season. You'll see that as well. Subtropics are definitely looking above average for the water as well. African coastline, we're seeing, we're starting to see the return of 20 degrees, 20 degrees Celsius sea surface temperatures, which is very cold. Um, but still, out in the MDR region as a whole, I'd say the further west you go, um, you start like on this little narrow quarter, and then the 80 degree waters expand outward as you head farther west. So the so the tropical system will have you know, more ways for it to go. Like, well, if I go this way, I'll get 80 degree plus waters. If I go this way, I'll have 80 degree plus waters. So it's pretty much 
you, this any tropical system because of this huge area of 80 degree waters, it's impossible if that if a storm were to come off of Africa, that it can't stay in these 80 degree waters because anywhere it goes, as long as it tracks west, it has nowhere to go but 80 degree waters, as you can see by all the yellow on the map. So look at the Caribbean water. So that's why I went that this little mini segment here is what I want to, you know, the takeaway here is that the ocean waters are really warm. They're supposed to be this time of year, but they're even warmer than they should be, and that's bad news. Well, good for hurricane season development, bad news for us. Caribbean, 0.6 degrees above average. The main development region, 0.4 degrees above average. North Atlantic has been soaring to about a half a degree above average. This includes the Arctic and the subtropics, mind you. And the East Tropical Atlantic is slightly above average, but closing in on average, but they're a pretty up and down um, region as well. Nino 3-4 region, closing in on La Nina here. Now here's what I wanted to show you, and I used to use this map very rarely in my past hurricane season discussions. I really introduced it in the last one, uh, and I want to show it to you guys again, because this is an updated one from the CFS Weekly Forecast. Just remember that the CFS Weekly Forecast may not be always correct, but mind you that this is an average of the last 48 forecasts, 12 runs, and 4 members. Alright, so this is 48 forecasts here. This was the 6Z update, because some because for some reason we went through the 12 and 18Z updates, they said not available. Um, it does take time for the model to process, even though, well, it's technically 18Z right now. Yes, but it takes time for the model to process it. So I took the um, the model run that was the latest model run, the most recent model run that was available from Chocolate Tidbits, and it was this one. All right. And by the time you guys might be watching, maybe they came out with another run, but nothing's really going to change much, especially since we're looking at a global scale here. But here's the main takeaway. Take a look at all that dark green you see. You see that? That is lots of convection. Chocolate convection from... Now, 13th of August through August 20th, uh, maybe not so off the African coastline. That's the thing, too. Even though convection could be above average for the Gulf, the Eastern Pacific, like the Eastern Pacific, we have several tropical disturbances in the Eastern Pacific, all right? And that's why we're seeing a lot of convection there. But the same could be said in the future for a place like um, the Gulf of Mexico. The same could be said eventually for uh, the Caribbean here, so Gulf Caribbean. But notice over Central Africa, all right, you can also look at the left side of the screen if you want to find Africa. There's a lot of sinking air. Now remember, even though the open waters of the Atlantic, all right, may have above average convection, remember, for the convection to get to the tropical Atlantic, it has to originate in Africa. This is where most of the tropical convection that comes this time of year originates, on the left side of the screen, from middle Africa. All right, the convection generates, it moves its way onto the west, and if that spot where the convection originates from, if we have more sinking air, then convection cannot generate. Therefore, there will be no convection to move out over the open waters of the Atlantic, even if conditions are conducive there. So that's something we'll have to watch too, but at the same token, we can still have maybe less development out by Africa later in the season, but maybe a lot more development in a place like the Caribbean or the East Coast or the Gulf of Mexico, right? And as well as the East Pac, the Eastern Pacific, as well as the Central Pacific, even Hawaii as well, is, is in that green zone. So that's something to keep in mind of as well. Now, even through the 20th through the 27th of August, now Africa is overtaken by a green. So this is where we start to see the convection really take over across the Atlantic. Now, the colors are not as deep as they were before, but we still have a lot of medium to dark green. And it's taking over the entire North Atlantic Ocean here, the entire North Atlantic Ocean Gulf in the Caribbean, as well as the East Pack, some of the darkest green, some of the strongest convection potential. Um, but even out in the NDR and its subtropics, out in the tropical Atlantic, still above, well above average convection. And even lastly, from the 27th of August to the 3rd of September, now Africa is in the darkest shade of green there is. All right, so lots of convection late August through September. But even the Gulf in the Caribbean and the East Coast, as well as the subtropics up here, or actually the subtropics down here, Gulf, Caribbean, East Coast, subtropics, still above average convection. All right. So look at the tropical intensity index here. How conducive are we seeing for development conditions here? Um, Gulf Mexico looks highly favorable. Uh, Caribbean, the northern and eastern edge of the Caribbean looks favorable, but most of it does not. But that can surely change in a, in a snap. Uh, East Coast, especially the southeast and mid-Atlantic coastlines, definitely looking favorable for, favorable for development. Now, look at the 26 and a half degree isotherm. Again, what this is, is basically saying we can have waters at the ocean surface of about 80 degrees or warmer, right? 
But the question is, how far underwater can we go and still see those 80 degree waters? The farther underwater we can go, the deeper the color, um, the better it is for developing tropical cyclone because tropical cyclones like it's nothing better than a tropical cyclone getting energy from the sea level and below sea level. So look at the Northern Caribbean here, all right? Above average, especially south of Cuba, the northwestern part of the Caribbean, we can go 450 feet, 500 feet, 450 to 500 feet below the ocean surface and still find those 80 degree waters. That is remarkable, truly. Even much of the Caribbean, we can still go 300 feet, 350 feet below the ocean surface and still find those 80 degree waters. Because typically, when we go below the ocean surface, the waters get colder, all right? So that's why this is such an ironic map and that if we still find 80 degree waters underwater, that helps, that aids in the development of a tropical cycle even more. Tropical cyclone heat potential, it's well at the top of the graph, probably even past that. Now, here was the same map I showed you at first, but in the Gulf of Mexico, again, most likely you'll go about 150 to 200 feet or so and find those 80 degree waters still, except for that central part of the Gulf of Mexico, which has been a little bit of a, you know, kind of like a haters kind of region. And, like, you know, we're just going to, you know, totally rebel and just do the opposite of what the rest of the Gulf of Mexico wants to do. Um, that's primarily because we have the Gulf Stream that's right here. And since it's right kind of next to the Gulf Stream, kind of like some different, very different air masses here. So that could be a, a factor. But the Western Gulf still, we got some, we still got medium on the tropical cyclone heat potential graphic. Then at that haters region in the central Gulf of Mexico is kind of like down close to 20 or so. You know, and then you got your, your Eastern Gulf of Mexico, which is getting energy from the Caribbean, is more towards the top of the graph. Now look at the Saharan air layer. Less dry air, the better. We know that, right? Well, Josephine, here is Josephine, and it's going through, it's going to bat a little bit of dry air. Again, a storm is not that big. It can't build a shield to protect itself. We even have another layer of dry air by, beyond that, but once it gets beyond that, as it looks right now, could be clear beyond that as it heads towards Bermuda, which is bad news for you guys in Bermuda. Central and Western Caribbean, as well as the entire Gulf of Mexico, the entire East Coast, very low on dry air. We do have some convection coming off the African coastline, but... Uh, it's in between an envelope of drier to the north and drier to the south. So not too much dry air, but things are certainly improving. Another problem for Josephine potentially will be the shear that I'll have to deal with. I think it will be dealing with that all the way to its death. Um, maybe getting close to the Bermuda, maybe a little bit less wind shear, but I think it'll be too late. The storm could be strung apart by then. Most of the Caribbean now seeing some high shear, which is good, but Gulf of Mexico and the southeast coast still seeing some pretty low shear, as well as out in the tropical Atlantic which is how Josephine formed in the first place. So look at their tropical cyclone heat potential. Again, there's your very high area uh, in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean, about average here, as well as the tropical Atlantic here. And looking at our wind shear anomalies, again, heading through Sunday morning, or excuse me, 11th through the 16th of August, 14th to the 19th, 17th to the 22nd, 20th to the 25th, wind shear will be average. We got some above average spots, we got some below average spots that kind of average each other out here. Kind of cancel each other out and as my latest hurricane season outlook for the remainder of the season an additional 11 to 14 named storms six to ten hurricanes three to six major hurricanes obviously this will be changing and our seasonal average for an entire season not additional but an average for an entire season is 12 named storms six hurricanes and three major hurricanes and as always this will be affected with josephine the high won't be exactly in this spot but josephine will be affected by the bermuda high and as some will be keeping watch over as well so thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I am Dweller Dude, signing off till next time. Catch you guys in the next video.